It's a pleasure to be here with Greshams as part of Lifelong Learning Week. And thank you very much for joining me to talk about Charles Edward Stewart. It's almost 300 years since, and it will be 300 years at the end of this year, since Charles Edward Stewart was born in Rome, Bonnet Prince Charlie. But in this age of sustainability, change, environmental and biological threats, how can we remember him? The concerns of 18th century European royalty seem impossibly remote. Who really remembers the deeds of Peter the Great, of Russia, of Frederick the Great, of Prussia, of Catherine the Great, or of Joseph II of Austria? But Charles Edward Stuart still has a life in the cultural memory of the world. Despite the fact that he never reigned, far less ruled, and whose claim to the British thrones was barely recognized, and the fact that his most famous adventure, the rising of 1745-46, was actually to restore his own father rather than himself to the throne, Charles is remembered. He spent his early life agitating and begging across Europe for military aid and political support, and his later years in alcoholism and domestic abuse. And yet he remains a fame of figure and fascination, one many find it hard to do justice to, more a myth than a man. For the caricaturist, and this includes some historians who should really know better, the friend of Montesquieu, who is supported by Voltaire, is an out-of-touch representative of Catholic absolutism, whose futile attempt to disturb Augustan Britain ended in well-merited disaster. For others, Charles is a romantic hero who almost changed history. Who was Bonnie Prince Charlie is one question I shall ask in the ensuing lecture. That question is intimately involved with two others. Who were the Jacobites and what did they want? And what were their greatest hits? What is the, what is the core of the Jacobite story? That core that makes today Culloden the most visited battlefield in the UK and has seen the Outlander series of Dana Gabaldon sell 30 million copies. Jacobitism was not just a single event, famous as the 1745 Rising is. It was a process and it was a movement. The Jacobite attempts are not just those of 1745 or 1715. They are of 1696, 1708, 1719, 1722, 1744, 1752, and 1759. The Jacobite cause was central to French foreign policy, and it became central to the British Imperial Army and central to the development of Romanticism and what became the national brand of Scotland today. And this is all centered round a man of doubtful personal qualities, no distinctive achievements. Not like the Tudors, he has no Reformation Armada or Shakespeare to his credit. Yet perhaps the mythology of the man and his cause tells us more than we think about ourselves and our past. At one spot, and we'll see it in a moment, Glenfinnan on 19th August 1745, Charles Edward and his supporters raised the royal standard of his father from a, 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 amid shouts of long live King James VIII, prosperity to Scotland and no union, from a small following which grew from 400 to 1,100 with the arrival of troops under Donald Cameron of Lochiel later that day. That event and the rising it made possible, which ended at Culloden, underpin a great deal of what Britain was to become, as well as raising the questions which once and now again threaten its coherence as a political unit. In 2018, almost 500,000 people visited this remote spot at the head of Loch Shiel, where a monument of a Scots Highlander stands on a tower 
designed by James Gillespie Graham in 1815 as an act of tribute and gratitude both to the men of the Jacobite Rising and, their and the role their descendants have played in British victory in the Napoleonic Wars. The Jacobite Express train from Fort William to Malague runs over the viaduct opposite, which is also the route for the Hogwarts Express in the Harry Potter films. The Jacobite Highlands are still a locale of magic and romance. But before they were magic and romance, they were politics. And Jacobitism takes its name from Jacobus, James, on the left there, James the seventh of Scotland and second of England, who was deposed on account not so much of his Catholicism, but of the Catholicism of his, uh, of his son and heir, born on the 10th June 1688, by William of Orange on the right. When it became clear that James would, would be fathering a Catholic dynasty, seven grandees, the Earls of Danby, Devonshire and Shrewsbury, Viscount Lumley, the Bishop of London, Edward Russell and Henry Sidney, both of whom gained titles uh, for their action, contacted James' nephew and son-in-law, William of Orange, who invaded England at the beginning of November. James fled and was subsequently excluded from the English crown under the fiction that he'd abdicated, and William and Mary were declared joint sovereigns. Although the Williamite succession was declared a glorious, that is, bloodless revolution by John Hamden in 1689, and is still commonly known by that dame today, it was anything but in Scotland and Ireland, where major battles were fought at the Boyne and Ochram. The last part of the British Isles held for James, the Bass Rock off the Lothian coast, did not surrender until 1694. In England, this may have been a glorious revolution. Elsewhere in the British kingdoms, it was a severe military struggle. Throughout most of the, ne of the rest of the next 60 or 70 years, the Jacobites in exile sought to, to perpetuate that struggle from the point of view of their own restoration. There is William on, uh, uh, on the left there. Uh, he still doesn't look very happy, even though he's got the, key, he's got the crown of, uh, crowns of England, Scotland, and Ireland to add to his, uh, his Dutch rule. And on the right is James from a medal issued in the 1690s, not James II and VII, but his son, called by many the Old Pretender. But those titles, the Old Pretender and the Young Pretender, which many of you will be familiar with, ultimately derive from the accusation of the illegitimacy of young James, the fact that he was only a pretended Prince of Wales, and so actually their terms of bias, uh, although they remain very popular, and I won't be using them. James's title as James III and VIII was widely recognized in continental Europe, though obviously not in the British Isles. His son is more properly Prince Charles because his title was barely recognized in diplomatic circles in Europe. These medals, and, and medals uh, of, with the, bearing the heads of royalty have been since the beginning of the 17th century, handed out as special gifts to courtiers, were on a different scale to the medals that Charles I might have handed out to his supporters and friends. They were manufactured on an industrial scale. Thousands of them were circulated to Jacobite supporters in the British Isles in the 1690s and later to allow the, to, for the expression of Jacobite sympath sympathy so they could demonstrate their Jacobite sympathy. And you'll see from the wear on young James's hair that those medals weren't just locked away. They were, and we don't know much about this yet, they were actually kept in circulation. So they, they were exchanged. You need quite a lot of rubbing to get to that stage of, a, a, of where on the highest points of the medal. They were exchanged and moved about as tokens of sympathy among a much wider audience than the many thousands who originally received them. Jacobite culture and Jacobite artwork, and I'll come to that, is everywhere. Scotland remained central 
and that's a contemporary map from, 17, uh, about from 1715, Scotland remained central to the Jacobite cause. And I'll be, of course, be returning to Scotland and to the palace at Holyrood House. That's how it looked in 1745, in which Charles uh, uh, held court in the autumn of 1745 later on. But one of the things I think it's so important to get across, both about Charles Edward and about the Jacobite movement as a whole, is that we still live in the world that arose out of the conflicts which led to the deposition of the Stuarts and the struggles between the Jacobites and uh, the successive governments of Great Britain. And one of the key ways in which we do is that the concept of parliamentary sovereignty, later refined to include the concept of the Crown and Parliament in 1720, the concept of parliamentary sovereignty, the illimitable sovereignty of Parliament, which is such a critical part of the Brexit process in the last four years, was articulated by the English Parliament in 1688-89 as part of its justification for the exclusion of the royal family. And that's its classic formulation for in the 19th century as an embedded part of British constitutional law by A.V. Dicey. The principle of parliamentary sovereignty means neither more nor less than this, namely that Parliament, thus defined, has under the English Constitution the right to make or unmake any law whatever, and further that no person or body is recognised by the law of England as having a right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. It took a little while, but by 1714, when the royal assent was given to a parliamentary bill, it was given automatically. It was an automatic constitutional process. It no longer really passed through the hands of the sovereign. But although James's daughters, first Mary with her husband William, became a queen and then Anne, succeeded him up to 1714, the change in 1714 was much greater. The exclusion of all Catholic heirs in England by the Act of Settlement in 1701, into which Scotland was incorporated by the Union Acts of 1707, led to the heirs of Sophia of Hanover succeeding to the British thrones as well as the Hanoverian electorate. And this is, I think, probably one of the most forgotten parts of all of Britain's history. The fact that Hanover, as it stood in 1719, and later on as it stood in 1789, a significant Central European power was part of the British monarchy between 1714 and 1837. And indeed, it was only because Hanover would not allow a woman to succeed that when Victoria became queen in 1837, the kingdom of Hanover, as it had become rather than the electorate by this time, was taken over by Ernst Augustus, fifth son of William IV. Um, had Hanover remained British, had it remained part of the British dominions, the history of the unification of modern Germany would have been much more problematic, for Bismarck would have found British as well as Austrian interests uh, stood in his way in terms of reuniting Germany in the latter part of the 19th century. But we have completely forgotten the role that Hanover played in British politics. The exclusion of the Stuarts, which was clearly there with James's daughters, the exclusion of the male line, now became the exclusion of 57 people, all of whom were Catholics, who were closer to the throne than George I. And for many people, it was a huge deal that so many of the, uh, uh, so many of the, the Stuarts were excluded. And it was a huge deal because the exclusion of the Stuarts was not simply the replacement of one dynasty by another. James and his son were not only the senior heirs of the Scottish royal line, uh, they were recognised as kings in Ireland, where the Lear Foil, identified in Ireland with the Scottish Stone of Destiny, although it wasn't, had been in legend used to, the cra to crown the high kings of Ireland at Tara. The Stuarts were also the senior heirs of the House of Tudor by the marriage of J James IV to Henry VII's daughter Margaret, the senior heirs of the House of Plantagenet, via the marriage of Alexander II of Scotland to Joan, the daughter of John, and through multiple other marriages throughout the Plantagenet era, and also the senior heirs of the House of Wessex, by the marriage of Malcolm III, Cian Maud of Scotland, to St. Margaret, granddaughter of Edmund Ironside, whose brother Edgar had been elected the last Saxon king by the Witenagemate 
as uh, William the Conqueror's forces approached London in 1066. In other words, the need to challenge the legitimacy of the Jacobites, to pretend that their, that their leaders were the old and young pretender, was central in British politics because their legitimacy was so overwhelming. They represented the senior heirs of every dynasty for a thousand years, as well as, the, as, well as being accepted as monarchs in both Scotland and Ireland. Now, Jacobitism had very significant differences in its motivation, depending where you came from in the British Isles. The Jacobites all wanted to restore James and his successors, James VIII and Charles Edward, born in 1720, who died in 1788, to the thrones of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And their goals were dynastic and religious on one level, but it was much more complicated than that. English and Welsh Jacobites tended to be motivated by the following uh, political goals. Dislike of foreigners and the Dutch Hanoverian connection of the royal family. Xenophobia, Little Englandism, these are very high on the, the lists of English, of English Jacobite uh, motivations. They had a particular view of Anglicanism, which later resurfaced as High Anglicanism, the Oxford movement in the 19th century, which disliked the Lutheranism of the Georges and preferred the close relationship between church and crown, which had existed under Charles I and Charles II. They favored the country and distrusted the city. They distrusted London and they distrusted the innovations in financial services, particularly the bond market and the Bank of England, which had come with the new regime in the 1690s, and the ability a rather topical ability, I think we all agree, for Great Britain to run a large national debt which came about ultimately through the movement to trade, bo to trade bonds to third parties which became uh, practice in the 1690s. They preferred a local to a financial economy, an economy that, that grew things and made things and was about relationships rather than an economy which was about money and debt and stocks and shares. And also because the Tories were suspected of being Jacobites by the, uh, by the Hanoverians, they were excluded from office between 1714 and 1760, and that was a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because it meant that naturally some of them who might otherwise not have been Jacobites became, ja some of them were Jacobites, became Jacobites because, hey, things weren't going too well for them. But Scotland and Ireland, the motivations are really strongly different. In Scotland, all the Stuarts opposed either the prospect before 1707 or the actuality after 1707 of the Union. And so a huge motivation for Scottish Jacobitism was opposition to the Union with England. In both Scotland and Ireland, the supporters of the Stuarts wanted to see a constitutional arrangement much more like the multi-kingdom monarchy of the Stuarts with subsidiary royal capitals in Edinburgh and Dublin, and England, Scotland, and Ireland kept as three distinct kingdoms with a stronger representation, including Catholic rights, as was made clear in the 1689 Dublin Parliament, a stronger representation uh, and say for the Irish Parliament, as well as the restoration of the Scottish Parliament. They wanted to see in Scotland the restoration of episcopacy, which although it was like, not identical with the Church of England, the Episcopalians didn't join the Anglican Communion until 1867, uh, which was like the Church of England, but was strongly associated with the Stuarts and the Stuart crown. And of course, in Ireland, they wanted, uh, Jacobites wanted a protection, extension of Catholic rights. Ultimately, these formed the largest group of active Jacobites. And both a large Scottish and Irish diaspora, soldiers, commanders, diplomats, governors and administrators, merchants and traders, spread across the whole of Europe because they had nowhere else to go. They were politically alienated from the society of uh, which was now had in the ascendancy in the British Isles. Here is, this, the, the Jacobite leadership was very sensitive to this. Uh, this is a medal, a famous medal, QSS uh, of James, uh, uh, linked to the 1708 uh, attempt to restore him to the crown, to the crowns. On one side, the medal says QSS, uh, 
whose is it? I brackets, it's me, right? And on the other side, it says, Rediti, give it back. What should be given back? Three kingdoms, Ireland, Scotland, and the third one called Britannia, Britain, not England. James is rhetorically separating both Scotland and Ireland, not just from England, but from the concept of Britain itself. And he's very clearly making it, making it obvious to his supporters that he has, expects to and wants to have rights which are separate but conjoined in all the three kingdoms. This was not fantasy politics in the era. The Stuarts, uh, uh, the multi-kingdom monarchy of the Stuarts was not dissimilar from a lot of uh, uh, polit similar political arrangements in early modern and indeed into 19th century Europe, including the United Kingdom of the Netherlands, which, from which Belgium split off, uh, the Polish, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, um, and uh, the United Kingdoms of Denmark and Norway, the Oldenburgs. So you can see, however, that Scottish and Irish Jacobitism and English Jacobitism, though they may both want a Stuart restoration, want it for very different reasons. And I'm not going to... Uh, one of the, the great vices of, of a, his being a historian is to be, is to be presentist, to see uh, the issues of history in terms of the issues of the present. And yet, you know, it's so tempting for Jacobitism. So, and I'm, I'm not going to presentist. I am actually going to take the present back and say that the difference between Scottish and Irish and English Jacobitism can almost, uh, between, a European, uh, between a European Jacobitism with greater stress on Scottish and Irish uh, nationality and a xenophobic um, Jacobitism which is very much introspective and dis distrusts the metropolis is in favour of the shires has got a very tempting similarity to remain and leave. A very tempting similarity indeed. And perhaps in that part of the British Isles where um, the revolution of 1688-89 is closest to the surface, Northern Ireland, if you actually count the supporters or, or the supporters of the DUP and the supporters of Sinn Féin and the intermediate parties and how they voted in the 2016 referendum, you will see that I'm not being presentist at all. So, that, so there is something deeply contemporary about Jacobitism and what it symbolizes. And I think we ought also to recognize that it is all round us, in so many ways all round us. This is um, the interior, and it's an Anglican church, hard to believe. Uh, it's the most Baroque interior of an Anglican church anyone, anyone has ever seen. And it is St. Michael and All Angels at Whitley in Worcestershire. And its design is by the Catholic and crypto-Jacobite architect James Gibbs, who, of course, will be famous as having built uh, quite, a, a, quite a number of very prominent 18th century buildings. Uh, and it's actually based on the design of the interior of the chapel at Canons, which was commissioned by the Jacobite Duke of Chandos. So by these statements of European uh, 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 exp expressions of European identity even for the Church of England Jacobites are clearly signposting uh, their uh, Catholic and continental links the Jacobite leadership was by now very much based on the continent displaced from France uh, after the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 it eventually took up residence, a long-term residence, in the Palazzo del Re in Rome from 1719 onwards. And the Jacobite court was there for more than 60 years. It became a center of uh, espionage, conspiracy, trade, plotting. And it was in Rome that Charles Edward Stuart was born on 31st December 1720, to James and Maria Clementina Sobieska, who was the daughter of the eldest son of John III Sobieski of Poland and Lithuania, still famous for his part, crucial part, in the victory over the Ottoman Empire at the gates of Vienna 
in 1683. So Charles came from, was embedded in European royalty, European Catholic royalty, since, of course, Poland long seen as, and some still seen today as some of the street protests indicate uh, in Poland in the last couple of weeks as a champion of Catholicism. And that is how James looked at the time of his son's birth by Antonio David. Now, Charles was brought up to be the great hope of the Jacobites. Uh, he was, the elder, he was the, the elder son of his father, and he showed promise, um, both in terms of languages, personality, and charisma, and also military promise by the 1730s. There was widespread discontent uh, in the British polity, um, not just because of the link to Hanover, and that's, that's a George III Hanover coin on the right-hand side, but also because of um, the long-standing accusations of corruption around Walpole's Whig administration and its imposition of taxes. That is a protest medal on the left. Again, you heavily circulated uh, from the excise in the 1730s. Walpole's imposition of taxes on Scotland seen as um, a satanic attack um, on the country's ability to... Uh, trade under, uh, under the terms that it had previously, enjoy previously enjoyed. That's why smuggling was such a political crime in Scotland and why the Porteous riots, which were ultimately uh, linked to the execution of a smuggler, were such a flashpoint in Edinburgh in 1736. By 1744, ten years after Charles had first seen military action, Louis XV's France and was embarrassed by its position in the War of Austrian Succession. Once again, Britain and France were fighting. This is what was happening all the time from William, of or from William of Orange's accession to the thrones onward. And Louis was prepared to launch, or to countenance the launch, of an invasion by the Jacobites to uh, improve his own position in war on the continent. But the build-up of his forces at the Channel ports was slow. British intelligence were alert was alert and unsympathetic French diplomats, not all of whom believed in the Jacobite cause, leaked uh, to their British counterparts some details of the invasion plan with the inevitable event, the inevitable results. Charles then decided to launch a rising himself, even though a vast majority of his supporters regarded French troops as critical to his success. What happened after that is often described as something that he did completely by himself but almost certainly, it's a deniable special operation of the French crown, which enables Louis to continue to support Charles, but not to appear to be committed to his cause. Um, Charles set sail with two ships uh, 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 in July 1745, the 64-gun Elizabeth and the Dutel and the Dutelle. Charles is far... Uh, uh, um, they go with 200 troops and quite a few guns. They're there to destroy. These two ships are setting out to destroy the entire superstructure uh, and infrastructure of the British state and empire. So, four days after they set out, the Royal Navy's Lion, which was an ancient 60-gun fourth rate, damaged one of the ships so badly that they, she had to return to port carrying with her all Charles's men and all his guns. So when Charles made landfall at Ereske, uh, he had only a handful of men with him, including his Lieutenant General, the Marquis of Tullibardine, and in Jacobite terms, the Duke of Athol, Colonel John Sullivan, his Quartermaster General and a French regular, and a cavalry officer, Sir John MacDonald. Those were his only three real soldiers. Naturally, he got rather a chilly reception. Doesn't look chilly at the Prince's Strand at Ereske there. That's, um, we had to wait 78 years to take that photograph. Um, but he, he ran into a lot of opposition. People didn't want to take the risk of rising uh, with no French support. And traditionally, it was, uh, it was Ranald MacDonald of Kinloch Moidart who made the first pledge of support six days after Charles Edward landed. But almost immediately, the small force that was gathered 
by the Jacobites made a significant difference. And on the 14th of August, they defeated the British reinforcements at Fort William. On the 16th, the first foot were defeated at Highbridge and Lagan. On the 19th, the standard was raised at Glenfinnan, and British forces were defeated at Inversnaid before the end of the month which included the capture of Cluny McPherson, who promptly joined the Jacobites. Charles II decided to return from Hanover. By 4th September, the Jacobite army were in Perth, where several other nobles joined them. Less than two weeks later, later the city gates of Edinburgh were <clears throat> accidentally left open. The Lord Provost Archibald Stuart, the clues in the name, uh, was subsequently tried, but found not proven, that elegant Scottish verdict of having aided and abetted the Jacobites. A crowd of 20,000, that's Glenfinnan on the left, a crowd of 20,000 greeted the entry of the Prince's army. Matters were, uh, changed rapidly. The British army in Scotland under Sir John Cote was defeated at Preston Pans four days later. Three days after that, on Jacobite-held territory in Scotland, taxes started to be levied on the pre-Union basis under the old Scottish pre-1707 Scottish tax system. On the 25th of September, the city of Aberdeen abandoned the government when the Jacobites raised a battalion of volunteers in the streets. On the 28th of September, a run began on the Bank of England and landholders began withholding their land taxes. The government started to be forced to borrow from the city and individual merchants in order to be able to keep up the military spending to participate in the War of the Austrian Succession and to bring the troops back to England who might be expected to crush the Jacobite rising. Prince Charles, meanwhile, was in Holyrood Palace. And that, although it's uh, somewhat difficult to see, I chose because it is a picture of Holyrood done by Paul Sandby, who was, uh, of course, a famous 18th century artist and a, and a military artist with the British Army in Scotland, and uh, was in Edinburgh for some years after 1746, and that's done by him. That was how it was in Charles's day. That was taken, done by Sandby, three years afterwards. And that's a more, modern, uh, a more modern photograph. And a picture of Gladstone's land, the oldest house um, in, that, in the lawn market at the top of the high street near the castle, which was built at the beginning of the 17th century. This was the kind of Edinburgh through which, in which large crowds gathered. The, Edinburgh was the second largest city in uh, Britain at the time, after a long way behind London, but still ahead of anywhere else. And these is where the crowds gathered. And in these narrow streets, the Jacobite army thronged. But Charles also, always alert to propaganda, wanted the most notable artist of the day in Edinburgh, Alan Ramsay, to take his picture, which became the basis of a propaganda print by the engraver Robert Strange. And Ramsay, who had actually visited the royal family, the Jacobite royal family in Rome in 1736, came down from where he was staying, which is, um, if anyone knows Edinburgh, in the middle of Ramsey Garden, which is Ramsey Lodge, is the center of Ramsey Garden, close by the castle, went down to Holyrood and did or began this painting of Charles Edward. Alan Ramsay later became a court painter to George III. So you can see that he was canny uh, as well as a good painter. Charles made a great play of holding a royal court at Holyrood. He stayed in the west wing of the Duke of Hamilton's departments, formerly those of Charles II's queen, uh, which had just been redecorated recently by William Adam. People came to the Great Hall to see him dine in the manner of, royal, uh, of European royalty. Eating in public was what kings did at this stage, particularly on continental Europe. The prince held levees and balls, and these seemed to have been organized rather as the Edinburgh assembly dances uh, of the period were organized, many of, who, many of whose presidents were in fact themselves Jacobites. That is, there was a first set of French and Italian dancers, uh, predominantly minuets and, uh, and, rela and related measures, and then there was a break for refreshments, and then there was Scottish country dancing. And just as an image of Jacobite material culture, the dress on the left we, has pretty good provenance as having been worn by Oliphant of, uh, Madame Oliphant of Gask, not Oliphant of Gask himself, but Madame Oliphant of Gask at one of the balls in Holyrood in 1745. And the right, provenance a bit less good, but we think uh, 
that that may have been worn by the Countess of Airely. Uh, so these are images of that strange autumn in 1745. But those forces opposing him were not idle. 6,000 Dutch troops were called in by the British government and 18 battalions and nine cavalry squadrons called back from the continent while the independent Highland companies, loyal to the British crown, uh, raised resistance in the north, which was later defeated at the Battle of Inverurie on the 20, in Inver Aberdeenshire on the 23rd of December. Charles had waited quite some time in Holyrood, but he had to move, and indeed the, mo the, the resolution to invade England was only carried by a single vote at his council. Many of them wanted to, uh, to stay in Scotland, recall the Scottish Parliament, and ask for French troops. Uh, Charles was of the view, strategically, that unless you attacked London, that was no go. So on 8th November, two Jacobite army divisions entered England, taking Carlisle a week later. And uh, the French, French um, troops, Scots and Irish and the French service, predominantly Scots in this first landing, landed with Lord John Drummond at Montrose in the 22nd of, on the 22nd of November. So the Jacobites maintained two armies one in Scotland, one in advance into England. Uh, the troops who were opposing them in England, uh, largely militia and local levies, were not regarded by their commanders as sufficient. And on the 23rd of November, uh, the defence of Manchester was abandoned by the government, and on the 3rd of December, the defence of Derby was abandoned. On the 5th of December, with the Jacobite army at Derby, the only forces between them and London were between one and 2,000 men at uh, Finchley, of whom the Black Watch, who were held in the south of England because they were widely regarded to be unreliable after their 1743 mutiny, were almost the only regular soldiers. Cumberland had his forces at Northampton and would not have got there in time. The Jacobites did not know this. Their intelligence was very poor. Charles was outvoted and he had to retreat. That's just to get the feel of it. It's a contemporary map, both of England, travellers comparing to England and Wales from the middle of the 18th century, and Derby and Derbyshire, Charles's furthest advance into England, the bridge at the end of the town. <coughs> Very much his commanders still thought uh, recruitment in England had been about 1,000 men, which was not terrific by any means, but the issue is that actually it was probably just as many as Charles II had got on the way to Worcester in 1651. So they were probably too optimistic in terms of the number of, of uh, men who had actually joined them. Charles's Scottish commanders really had the opposition to the Union dimension of Jacobitism at their heart in terms of their opinion. And what, there were one or two significant exceptions, but that's more or less it. In terms of their opinion, and the way that the political view that they wanted to put forward. So uh, Charles himself had repealed the Union, a declaration at Edinburgh on the 14th of October 1745, and was still very conscious uh, in, the, uh, 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 in writing to Louis XV in November 1746 that the, uh, the oppressions and depredations after Culloden were threatening his kingdom of Scotland. And later, Chevalier de Johnston, one of his officers, who became aide-de-camp, who was both aide-de-camp to Lord George Murray in 1745, to the Jacobite Lieutenant General, and later aide-de-camp to the French General Montcalm at Quebec in 1759, put very strongly that patriotic view, the Scots have preserved their liberty and independence down to the union of the two kingdoms in 1707. Very interestingly, when we come to that moment at Quebec, 14 years later, Chevalier de Johnston is fighting on the French side, but Wolfe's troops are able to reach the Plains of Abraham because another Scottish Jacobite French officer has changed his mind about the politics of the world and has joined the British army, a Captain MacDonald, and he gives the password to the French sentries in good enough French to deceive them, and so the British troops can progress onto the Plains of Abraham. Well, Charles's army was still successful even in retreat, 
So um, the British, the British uh, army was now chasing him. The British advance guard was beaten off at Clifton by Lord George Murray's charge on the 18th of December, 1745. Lord Lewis Gordon uh, beat the Scottish uh, um, uh, government troops at Inverurie on the 23rd of December. And the British army was again defeated. A substantial force under Henry Hawley was defeated at Falkirk on the 18th of January, 1746. But the Jacobite army was still in retreat mode. There was now a lot of division in the Kai command between Charles and his officers, who, particularly Lord George Murray, really saw the situation as unwinnable and was keen to pull back and disperse his troops in the hope that things would be after the same as they'd been after previous risings, that is, that after a bit of fuss, everything would die down. They were very wrong about that. The Jacobites then thus lost the East Coast ports and the reinforcements of men and material could no longer be landed from France. The last uh, convoy came in but a day or two late after the Jacobites had lost Edward Aberdeen and Peterhead. On the 20th of March, General Bland's forces were defeated at Keith in the northeast of Scotland by Lord John Drummond, but that was it. Perth and Drummond's division failed to contest the Spey. Drummond retreated from Nairn with the Jacobite cavalry fight for having a fighting retreat, and we move on to Culloden. I won't dwell, I've, I've written a book on Culloden, and I won't dwell on the battle in too much detail here, but just as we, we began with the start of the Jacobite rising, so we must see it through to its finish. And although it went on, uh, there's an attempt, there are attempts after Culloden. Culloden is not perhaps understood at the time, but certainly understood in retrospect as the end of the Jacobite cause. So this is a contemporary French map, and you may be able or may not be able to see that on one side, it's not particularly accurate, it says l'armée écossaise, and on the other side, l'armée angloise, the English and the Scottish armies. We now generally think of Culloden as a civil war, a battle where there were members of the same family on different sides, and that's indeed true. But it also was a war, a conflict with a strongly national dimension. That was how it was understood by many of its participants on the day and by the French officers who fought alongside the Jacobites. And here in a much more modern, though I think this will still be developed map, you can see what happened that day and that fundamentally the British army is in red, the Jacobites are in blue, that fundamentally the Jacobites were outnumbered. They had no second line, but what we think we, we know, so they had to put all their troops into the first line with the hope of breaking the British army straight away, and they didn't manage to do it. But the thing we think we know about Culloden is not what we know about Culloden. Because we think, and this is how it's nearly always presented, that Culloden was a victory for British guns over Jacobite swords. But in fact, it was very nearly the opposite. The Jacobites, and that's what the Battlefield Archaeology shows, laid down enormous amount of fire on the ground at Culloden, particularly a firefight down, uh, uh, down close to where the B9006 road runs in the latter stages of the battle. But they were successfully, almost successfully encircled. Some of them got away. The encirclement wasn't complete by cavalry. So the dragoon and cavalry superiority of Cumberland's army that day was absolutely critical, and they, of course, attacked with swords. That is um, the battlefield of Culloden today, and one of the interesting things is on the right uh, is, that you, is that the right, you can see just that there's, as the line slopes up, this is standing on the Jacobite front line, as the line slopes up, it actually goes out of sight because it dips down the other side of the crest, and the left and the right wings could not see each other. They never intended to fight on that ground. Prince Charlie did not choose the field himself, the graveyard of Culloden, as the song goes. That was the ground on which they had to fight after their retreat following the unsuccessful night attack, which left too late for the very obvious reason that you can see a thin strand of blue in the left photograph. And that thin strand of blue is the Murray Firth, and on the Murray Firth was the Royal Navy, and the Royal Navy had telescopes and it was Scotland in the middle of April, 
and it got dark rather late to set off. So, out of such, uh, out of such conflict and accidents, history changes. There were fewer than 14,000 men on the field that cold, wet April day on the edge of Europe, but Culloden is still a decisive battle in terms of the history of the world. Uh, this is, to some extent, what-if history. I agree. But it is at least possible that some, if not all, of these things would have happened. Not victory at Culloden, it was too late by then, but the victory in the campaign would have changed or could have changed the world, not least because any restored Stuart dynasty would have had a relationship with France closer to that of Charles II than that of the uh, Hanoverians. In that case, there would have been, shall we say, a not, perhaps not so much an entente cordiale, but at least a cohabitation policy rather than a confrontational policy with French imperial power. The War of 1756-63, the Seven Years' War, would not then have occurred. If it had not occurred, the American Revolution would have had to take place with large numbers of French troops in Canada unable to enter the Louisiana, the Louisiana territories, which would no longer have been so isolated as they became after the British victories in the late 1750s. France would not have become so impoverished in the wars of the 1750s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, which means there's a very good chance that it would not have collapsed under the pressure of agricultural failure and a poor economy into revolutionary politics in 1789, which means that there is no Napoleon and the changing of the face of Europe that was the legacy of Napoleon and the agreements after his fall at Vienna in 1815. Jacobitism changed the world because, and this is one of its most famous images, a David Morier painting originally done for Cumberland, showing the classic tropes of the Jacobite soldier. Um, hairy, there's a chap there lying on the ground. You're wondering what's under his kilt, his thighs agreeably raised, all armed with swords, some of them carrying that thing on a pole, which is a lacabar axe, which is not used at Culloden. Hairy primitives against strong, modern 18th century army. But that was always a propaganda piece. That's not how it was. Those are, incidentally, two pistols, just to give you a sense of the very similitude, two pistol balls fired from the second line, uh, probably from French or Spanish pistols, and pistols would be fired at very close quarters by Jacobites against the advancing British army on the day of Culloden. It was a very different battle from the way it's remembered, and just as I started by talking about memory, I'm going to finish by saying Jacobitism was a very different cause and a very different set of values from the way it's remembered. It differed nationally, it differed dynastically, and it was a pan-European movement. The Battle of Culloden was not just a dynastic conflict. It was not fought between a modern army and Highland clans who, didn't, who, who were uh, primitive by comparison. It was not fought between Catholics and Protestants. It was not a victory of muskets over swords. It was not fought on a site chosen in defiance of good advice by Charles Edward Stuart and his Irish officers. It was not fought to end a British civil war, and it was not either a defeat for Scottish nationalism. Jacobitism was bigger than all those things. But in the aftermath of Culloden, there was a determination for Jacobitism to never happen again. And that led, and I won't dwell on it today uh, as, the, as the lecture is drawing to its close, that led to an enormous amount of brutality, both immediately after the battle and in the longer term. Indeed, General Bland, who in his 1743 treatise on military discipline, had talked about having a respectful attitude by occupying military forces towards the civilian population, who was three years later writing to the Earl of Loudoun, destroy all persons you can find who have been in the rebellion or their abettors. Well, what's an abettor of rebellion 
somebody who gives somebody a drink of milk? It often was in 1746. Cumberland was initially very positive that within a month or six weeks, he'd have sorted things out on the 23rd of April. Ten years later, there were still 60 British Army patrols in Scotland. The commentary by, Andrew, by the contemporary and biographer of Cumberland, Andrew Henderson, the, military, the victory at Culloden gave birth to an expressible joy throughout, through the extensive dominions of the British Empire. Not only Europe and Africa, but the two Indies joined in the shout and gave joyful acclamations. It was not entirely an exaggeration, but whether it's, uh, uh, and it was not entirely true either. But what it does signify is the global nature of Jacobitism and the Jacobite threat, and yet its ineradicable domestication within Scotland. When Cumberland left for England on the 18th of July, he left troops not in the Highlands, but in the Edinburgh and Borders, in Glasgow, in Dundee and Angus, in Aberdeen, the northeast, at East Lothian, at Stirling, at Perth. 27 borough deployments, 12,000 men, the size of the British establishment in Ireland and a quarter the size of the British Standing Army in 1756. The occupation of Scotland after Culloden was big business. But the international dimension of that, which led on recommendations from, ja from General Wolfe to, uh, initially to, Barrington, to Lord Barrington as Defence Secretary and then to Pitt, who then claimed all the credit for himself, William Pitt the Elder, to actually solve the problem of Jacobitism long term by recruiting ex-Jacobite soldiers into the British Army, came to fruition in the Seven Years' War in Canada. The depopulation which Cumberland had hoped to see was not in the Highlands, was not possible, politically possible, in the aftermath of 1746, because Cumberland speedily got himself into very hot water indeed. People disapproved of him in London uh, and elsewhere, not just in Scotland, very soon because of, his, because of the exceptional brutality with which he'd suppressed the rising. But he remained influential in the army, and therefore it was British forces, when British forces initiated the Grand Arrangement of 1755, which expelled 80% or more of the French-speaking settlers from Nova Scotia, they were following in Cumberland's footsteps and in his policy for the Highlands. Cumberland said himself in the Grand Arrangement, I wish we could have done the same in La Haba, but we can do it here and now. That's just a picture of the Acadian expulsions. So the nature of the Seven Years' War, the ultimate final war for victory between Britain and France, the nature of the British polity, the nature of its relationship with Europe and the world, all of these things are intimately connected with the Jacobites and Charles Edward Stuart and whether they won or lost. And Fort George, still in use as a barracks today, is a monument completed in 1756, which cost £2 million at the time, which could ill be afforded by a British government already deeply in the national debt and starting a, a global war with France uh, in the second half of that decade. Fort George symbolized in its size and strength on a remote peninsula, Ardesir, near Inverness, just how worried the British government were about the Jacobites. Many people still think that the Jacobite cause was futile and that it was bound to fail, but that's not what was thought at the time. Thomas Paine to Thomas Jefferson, 1776. The descent that was made in 1745 had nearly proved fatal to the anglo hanoverian government. And Marc Antonio Beretti to James Boswell in 1768. If the Corsicans are successful in fighting for liberty, they will be no rebels. And this will likewise be the case when your Americans set up for themselves. Not to say he expected the Americans to revolt in 1768, interestingly. Not to say it had been likewise the case if your Scotch had succeeded in their last rebellion. In the 18th century, Jacobitism was understood as geopolitical politics. And it also went on in the writing that came out of the Jacobite movement often produced by people who were closely linked with it, 
writers like Alastair McVeister, Alastair, who was a, an officer in the Jacobite army, writers like James McPherson and the huge cult of Ossian, who, who's, who had 17 relatives in the McPherson regiment alone, and writers like Sir Walter Scott, whose own father was recruited to join Murray of Broughton's Hussars for the Jacobites in 1745. All of these created what is still the image of romantic Scotland, the land of the mountain and the mist. And just as the French had been familiar throughout the 18th century with Les Montagnards of Scotland, the Highlanders of Scotland, well, they saw Scotland as almost entirely Highland, fighting to restore the Jacobites, so that fused with the cult of Swiss liberty and independence arising from the popularity of Rousseau gave rise to the Montagnard, the Jacobins who sat on the high benches in the National Assembly in the early 1790s. These are just some of the paintings, uh, I've finished with just some of the paintings from Romantic France of Macpherson's characters and images from Ossian. A warrior Scotland, an ancient Scotland, a chivalric Scotland, the last echoes of France's ancient alliance with Scotland, and a country where the mountain, the mountains and liberty were conjoined in their struggle to restore the Jacobites and Charles Edward Stuart. That link on the last page in front of you now will take you to the database of the officers of the Jacobite armies, and it contains the names so far of more than 3,000 Scottish, English, and Irish men who served at commissioned rank in the Jacobite armies from 1688 to 1760. A huge number of people were involved in this movement. It was a European movement. It's of global significance, and its defeat and, or, or, or its victory determined the nature of the Britain we live in today. Thank you. Professor Piddock, thank you very much for a really fascinating lecture. We've had some questions from uh, the online audience, um, and if you don't mind, we, I think we have enough time to take a few. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Charles Edward Stuart versus the Duke of Cumberland. Which representation is more biased according to the records and narrations of the 45? Which, which is more biased? I, um, I'm not sure which, uh, uh, between which. I think, I think the questioner is asking between Charles Edward Stuart versus the Duke of Cumberland. Um, Cumberland, despite some attempts to rehabilitate him, was widely disliked uh, as soon, almost as soon as he got back to London because uh, gossip started to circulate at a levee in early May 1746 that there were actually almost no Scottish prisoners. Almost all the prisoners he'd taken were in the French service. And uh, then it was suggested that he should be made a freeman of the butcher's company in the autumn of 1746, and a, a large pamphlet with a picture of a butcher on it with an axe uh, was published in London in 1746. So basically, um, if we're talking about, uh, uh, talking about bias, Cumberland, Cumberland's version of events uh, is not one that was accepted almost from the start and almost everywhere. Um, so I guess it would be the more biased. Thank you. Um, a quick one. Did he leave issue in France? At least I think it's a quick one. <laughs> Um, Charles had one, there have been many people who suggested they might be descended from Charles. Charles had one illegitimate daughter whom he legitimized, but legitimized from the point of view of inheritance. Legitimizing it doesn't mean she can become, uh, uh, I mean, inheritance under a, a personal property, not inheritance of a crown, uh, who was Charlotte, Duchess of Albany, who died in the early 1790s. And she was at some time in France. Um, but not always. Was he raised to fight to regain the throne, or was it a response to pressure from the Highlanders? Uh, he was raised to fight to regain the throne, but there was strong support uh, for him to do so. Uh, 
And the, um, by the late 1730s, as the political situation got more uh, opportune, uh, there was a significant traffic between Scotland in particular and the Jacobite court to put in place the uh, developments which would be necessary to launch a successful rising. Thank you. There were some other what if questions, but I think your, your lecture ably answered most of those. So um, I think we will stop there with another thank you very much for, as I said, a fascinating lecture. <laughs>